Hello, I'm Chris Potts, here on behalf of my full team, Zhangshuan Wu, Atticus Geiger, and Dao Kila. We are introducing Dynascent, a new dynamic benchmark for sentiment analysis. Sentiment was one of the first areas of natural language understanding to be revolutionized by data-driven methods and among the first to achieve widespread industry adoption. In 2014, Seth Grimes surveyed industry practitioners in response to a prompt about what they currently need or expect to need to extract and analyze. Sentiment had the second highest rate of positive responses. But these applications are not always clear wins for industry. In that same survey, one respondent said that sentiment systems will always be flawed and many solutions are so bad they're not worth using. The disconnect here is clear. In NLP, we talk about sentiment as being easy or solved, and yet we're falling short when it comes to successful applications. We believe data is a key aspect to this. As a community, we think we've made more progress than we have because available sentiment benchmarks are limited. And that's the central motivation behind Dynascent. We aim to create a dynamic benchmark for sentiment that can respond to evolving needs from industry and research. With the present paper, we're introducing the first two of what we hope are many rounds of Dynascent. And this diagram provides an overview of the project so far. We're going to leverage two very strong models to find or create challenging sentences, which are validated by humans, to provide two rounds for the data set. By weaving models into this process, we help ensure that we have a data set that is very challenging for current approaches. You can see we're also exploring two methods for obtaining these hard examples, harvesting them from naturally occurring data and creating them as part of an adversarial model and human in the loop process. Let's look more closely at the process of creating Dynasets starting with round one. The first player in our story is model zero, which we're gonna use as a device for finding hard examples. Model zero begins with Roberta pre-trained parameters and is fine-tuned on these large data sets that you see here. We've cast this as a ternary problem that is positive, negative, neutral. That's the simplest formulation that still does justice to the fact that not all texts express sentiment. Perhaps the main thing to point out here is that our neutral category is the smallest of the three. That's sort of misaligned with real-world distributions of sentiment, and it will affect our models and results, as you'll see. For tracking performance throughout the project, we use these three external test sets in addition to those created for Dynascent. Model Zero performs well on all three, though the neutral category is already arguably emerging as a troublemaker. It has the lowest performance across the board and by wide margins. Now, as I said, Model Zero is really just a device for finding hard examples, and our hunt for those examples was conducted in the Yelp academic data set. We employ a simple procedure from the ocean of available sentences we oversample sentences where there's a sentiment tension between the sentence level model prediction and the review level rating of the text. The idea is that this is likely to help us locate sentences that the model is not properly understanding for whatever reason. It's merely a heuristic since of course positive sentences can appear in negative reviews and vice versa, but we don't need it to be perfect. All the sentences in Dynascent are multiply validated by crowd workers. In that task, after being presented with guidelines, workers were shown a sentence and asked to label it as positive, negative, no sentiment, that is neutral, or mixed sentiment. All the examples in Dynascent have labels from five crowd workers, and do see our paper for the methods we use to identify and retain high quality labels and workers. That labeling procedure leads us to this data set. Because we have five labels per example, there are two perspectives we can take. In distributional training, we repeat each example five times with each of its labels. This allows us to use all the examples, even those without a majority and it lets us embrace the uncertainty that's present in our labels. In practice, we found that this kind of training led to consistently better results. We can also take a more traditional route. Here an example has a label X if at least three of the five workers chose X. Our Devon test sets are balanced across the three inferred label categories with no mixed or non-majority examples. You'll notice that in our train sets, the class distribution has shifted. In our external benchmarks, neutral is the smallest category, and now it's the largest. This is more realistic, but it is likely to introduce new challenges. Finally, it looks like our attempt to find hard, naturally occurring examples was successful. Overall, 47% of examples are adversarial in the sense that Model Zero gets them wrong. Now, we made sure that Model Zero is totally stumped by our test sets. By design, it performs at chance on round one Devon test. For benchmarking, it's useful to have an estimate of human performance using the same metric we use for model evaluations. And to create those, we synthesized five comprehensive human labelers from our response distributions and compared each to our inferred labels, averaging the results. This leads us to estimates of human performance on round one that are around 0.88, 
macro averaged F1. We emphasize that this is a conservative estimate. Nearly half of our workers never disagreed with the inferred majority label on any example they saw, suggesting that human performance is nearer to perfection, at least for some humans. Nonetheless, though, let's say this. If models start to surpass this estimate of human performance, then it's time to consider using those models to create new rounds of Dynascent. Further hill climbing on the existing ones might not be all that productive. Now to round two. In this round, we're going to train a model on our round one data plus a lot of external data, and then have crowd workers try to fool it with a separate human validation step as before. So for model one, this is again a Roberta-based sentiment classifier. We're leveraging those same external data sets from before to fine tune it, but now with somewhat different protocols. So we've oversampled the SST, we've undersampled Yelp and Amazon while also balancing out their label imbalances, and we've included two copies of our round one data with distributional labels. This is meant to encode our values, especially our goal of doing well on Dynascent. And here's how model one does. First, it's great to see that we're getting traction on round one. There's a bit of a concern though, model one has dropped in performance relative to model zero on Yelp and Amazon. We think this might be unavoidable given our goals of doing well on Dynascent. We wanna start shifting to the Dynascent labels and label distributions, and we're starting to see some trade-offs in doing this when it comes to the external benchmarks. Now that we have model one, we wanna start using it to obtain hard sentiment examples. And to do this, we're gonna rely on the new Dynabench platform. Dynabench is an open source platform and makes it remarkably easy to put models in the loop during dataset creation. And Dynascent is in fact one of the first Dynabench datasets along with those for NLI, hate speech detection, and question answering. For Dynascent, we initially used Dynabench out of the box. Workers simply had to try to fool the model by writing examples from scratch. We saw, though, that this was leading to examples that tended to be short and employed a small set of techniques that were going to lead to dataset artifacts. And to help avoid this, we moved to what we, we call our prompt condition. In this condition, the worker sets up their task as usual. For instance, this worker is going to try to write a sentence that is negative, but that the model signs a different label. However, now we offer the worker a prompt sentence drawn from the Yelp dataset that they can, if they choose, use to, to, as a starter to modify it to achieve their goal. We found that this led to more naturalistic examples, and so we used the prompt condition for essentially the entire round, relegating our small number of no prompt examples to the train set where they can easily be excluded. Our validation process was the same as for round one, and this, this leads us to the round two data set. As before, all examples have five labels, so we can use distributional training, or we can infer labels and train on those. And as for round one, the dev and test sets are designed to be balanced across our three classes and maximally hard for model one. Now the overall rate of adversarial examples is only 19% for this round. That's much lower than round one. We think two major factors are in play here. First, the cognitive demands of our task are high, and so some workers lose track of what their goal is and write sentences that the model actually gets right. Second, model one is hard to fool. It's a good model. And I know this from experience because I've confidently tried to fool it and been less successful than I would have liked. Nonetheless, we have a solid round two data set. As before, we ensure that model one performs at chance on this round and our estimate of human performance is high, in fact, higher than round one at around 0.90. And this ignores the fact that many workers are arguably close to perfection. So that's Dynascent thus far. Let me close with some general lessons that we're applying to future rounds and future modeling efforts. As I said before, prompts are useful. We found that workers made good use of them. As measured by edit distance, they tended to make substantial numbers of edits without, though, discarding the prompt entirely. In addition, prompt-derived sentences have greater vocabulary diversity. No prompt sentences, in gray here, have very small vocabularies overall, whereas prompt sentences, in blue, have overall a vocab that's more like that of our round one naturally occurring cases, which you see in red. Thus, we think prompts could be valuable for adversarial example creation in general. Basically, it reduces the burden of creative writing. A second insight from Dynascent concerns the neutral category. Our neutral category has a semantics that's determined or at least constrained by our validation task. By contrast, neutral categories that we infer from star ratings have much more diversity to them. And to support this intuition, we relabeled the dev set of the SST using our validation protocols. Here's a confusion matrix for the two labeling efforts. Now, it's reassuring that there are relatively few sentiment confusions. And by the way, we think all of these favor our own labels over SST. 
More crucially though, you can see that the SST neutral category is distributed across our classes. And the lesson here seems clear. Three star reviews mix neutral, mixed, and uncertain sentiment. So we should be cautious when using such reviews to train models to find neutral examples in the wild. And this brings me to our final analysis for the talk. You might be wondering why we didn't fine tune model zero on our round one data to obtain model one. We retrained everything from scratch. And the reason is that we often experienced catastrophic failures for the neutral category when trying to fine tune. And to diagnose the problem, we employed the inoculation by fine tuning method, and it gave what you might call textbook results. Consider the left panel here for our positive class. As we fine tune model zero on more and more round one data, Performance on the positive class steadily improves, and we maintain performance on our three external benchmarks. The same is true for the negative class, but the picture for the neutral category is much more worrisome. As we do better on our neutral category with more fine tuning, we do worse for this category on the external benchmarks. This pattern is indicative of label shift, the same sort of label shift that we just saw with the SST a moment ago. Now, we firmly believe Dynascent has the better notion of neutral, so we hope to continue to lean on Dynascent to create models that can make good neutral predictions, even if it costs us on these external benchmarks. Okay, to wrap up, our best model so far using all of Dynascent gets around 0.83 F1 on round one and 0.71 on round two, but we're sure these aren't the best models conceivable, and we would love to see someone do better. After all, that would give us a model that we could use to power another round of Dynascent. We ourselves are already at work on new rounds of Dynascent, focusing on more emotional dimensions and domains outside of product reviews. And finally, here's a link to the project repository, which provides the data set, starter code, models, a data sheet, a model card, and notebooks to reproduce everything from the paper. Please do let us know what you learn about Dynascent from working with it, and thank you for watching.